Let's open your Bibles to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians. And as we turn there today, we're reminded of all the things that happen in the world. And we think about how crazy things are getting. We think about what's the solution. Well, the solution to the change of people is through the word of God. That's the solution to the change of people is through the word of God. And that's what our focus is going to be on today. The power of the word of God. The power of the word of God. You see, God's word is powerful to save. We know that through the work of the gospel, the euangelion. God's word is powerful to save, but it's also powerful enough to help us to grow. And we call that sanctification. So for salvation and sanctification, God's word is capable of doing everything. When you look at Colossians, the layout that we're going to go over today is verses 1 through 14. And believe it or not, Those are three sentences. Actually, the first one is a greeting. Paul's greeting to those at Colossae. The rest of it is two long sentences. That's right, two long sentences. The first sentence is verse 3 through 8. The second sentence is verse 9 through 14. So even though we're covering 14 verses today, we're actually covering... Two sentences and a greeting. And trust me, those two sentences and a greeting are packed full of the the greatness of Christ and how he's redeemed us and, and how his word helps us to grow. Those two sentences are packed. And if my wife were here today, she'd say, that's like you. You say a lot for a little. She's in the daycare today, so... She says, man, you said a lot of words. You could have just said this. So, let's go to the text and let's read those 14 verses. And then we'll get into it. And I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. I know some of you guys, raise your hand if you have one of those. I know Jeff does. Well, you used to anyway. I'm reading from the Legacy Standard. It's like an updated version of the NASB and it changes words like Lord for Yahweh. So I'll be reading from that today. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world also as it is constantly bearing fruit and multiplying, just as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard and understood the grace of truth, the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow slave, who is faithful, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, who also informed us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the full knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and multiplying in the full knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, who rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. (sighs) Those are two long sentences, two long sentences, but they're jam-packed full of the truth of Christ's deity and his salvific power and the power of his 
uh, sanctification in, in our lives. And we see the, the main theme of Colossians is spelled out very well in verse 15 of chapter 1, where it says, it's talking about Christ here. This is the theme of the book. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, or all, th- all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and enemies in mind and in evil deeds, but now he reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. The deity of Christ, the power of salvation through Christ, the power through Christ to keep us on the right path and sanctification are all right here. He's reconciled us to the Father. Christ is central in all the scripture, but especially here in Colossians. He's the one who gives us strength. He's the one who gives us reconciliation. He is the center of the gospel, other known as the word. Christ is the center. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today on this Sunday to praise your holy name, to worship you, Lord. Be with me as I expound your text and let all the ears be willing to listen and act upon it. Amen. Well, the book of Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul. It's a prison epistle written along with Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. This was written while Paul was in the Roman prison. He has visitors there. His imprisonment there is not harsh. He's able to um, write and he's able to visit with people. And he writes these prison epistles and he has them delivered by messengers. Well, who is this Paul? We all know Paul, but let's have a little brush up here. He's a Jew. He was taught the Old Testament scripture by Gamaliel, the, the great scholar He's a Roman citizen of a town called Tarsus in Asia Minor. He is a man who was on his way to persecute Christians. And on his path to persecute Christians, Jesus Christ himself stopped him and made him work for him. He was changed. Well, here is Paul, this man who was changed by the Lord Jesus Christ, He was chosen to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And he did three main missionary journeys. And here he is imprisoned. Turn to chapter 4, verse 3. Chapter 4, verse 3 says, Praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak the mysteries of Christ for which I have also been bound. He has been in prison for speaking of Christ. And then down in verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings and also Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And then down in verse 18, the greeting is in my own hand, Paul, remember my chains, grace be with you. This is written in about the year 60 to 62 AD, some 30 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. You see, Paul was a gospel messenger, one who was spreading the good news of this Christ who changed him 
on his way to persecute the very Christians who followed him. And then he says, and Timothy, our brother. Who's Timothy? Well, Timothy was a young guy. He ended up being a pastor that Paul led. Paul led him to Christ in his first missionary journey. You see, he mentions Timothy here, not that Timothy is writing the letter, but Timothy is with him. Paul had a, uh, a habit of doing that. It says he's the brother. He's the member of the body of, the Christ, of, of Christ. He's the brother. Well, who's the one who delivered this letter? Let's go to Colossians 4. We'll see who delivered this letter. Colossians 4, 7 through 9 says, Tychius, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow slave in the Lord, will make known to you all my affairs, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will inform you about the whole situation here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Mark. So we have Tychius and Onesimus are delivering this letter. Who's the letter written to? To the saints, to the brothers. So these are other brothers. They're saints. They're faithful. They're set aside. They're reliable. They're worthy. That's why he's calling them faithful. And then he says they're in Christ. We see that a lot in the scripture. They're they're in Christ, in Colossae. Well, their, their physical location is in the town of Colossae. Well, their spiritual standing is in Christ. This is important because he's talking to believers. Let's find out a little bit about Colossae. In chapter 4, verse 16, we see that in chapter 4, verse 16, it says, And when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church at, of the Laodiceans, and you for your part read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. So this letter is to be circulated. So Colossae is east of Laodicea. It's uh, in modern day Turkey. And so these are letters that are to be circulated and read to different churches. And these towns are full of Jews and Gentiles, mostly Gentiles. Uh, we can see uh, what kind of issues these people dealt with by what type of people they had there. So you had a mix of Jews and Gentile. You had a mix of legalism and Gnosticism. Gnosticism is knowing things makes you closer to God, and they don't believe that Christ is God. And you see in chapter 2, verse 8, chapter 2, verse 8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him is the fullness, the fullness of deity uh, dwells bodily. So we see this, they're focused on other things other than Christ. And then we have a show of legalism in chapter 2, 16. Therefore, no one is to judge you in food and drink or in respect to a festival or new moon or Sabbath day. Things which are only a shadow of what is to come, but the sus substance belongs to Christ. Chapter 2, verse 20. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourselves to decrees? Do not handle, do not taste, nor touch, which deal with everything destined to perish with use which are in accordance with the commands and teachings of men, which are matters having to be sure a word of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are have no value against fleshly indulgence. These are the issues that the people in Colossae were dealing with. False religion, legalism, Gnosticism. And they even dealt with synchronism, where you mix Judaism or Christianity with other religions. We see that a little bit today. We see that in chapter 2, verse 18. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels. The worship of angels. We don't worship angels. You see, they had a lot of issues in the Colossian church. 
And Paul is writing this to correct these issues. Let's go back to chapter 1. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We see that in all of Paul's letters. This grace provides ongoing sanctification and growth, perseverance, determine, which is determination in the face of difficulty. In chapter 1, verse 23, it says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. He says, if you continue in the faith, firmly grounded and steadfast, continue. This is what God's grace does. It allows us to continue to be steadfast. The result of that steadfastness is peace. We have peace with God. We have peace because of our steadfastness in the gospel. Paul says, grace and peace to you from God our Father. He says, we give thanks to you. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. He's saying that while they're praying, they're always giving thanks for them while they're praying. It's interesting that he calls God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, acknowledging Christ's deity. In chapter 1, verse 19, it says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And in chapter 2, verse 9, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. There's a reason Christ is talking about the deity of Christ and the supremacy of Christ. Because it's only in Christ that you may be saved, and it's through his word that the gospel is presented. So why is Paul giving thanks? Why? It's because of their faith, it says. Their faith and their love. Their faith and their love. We always hear about faith, love, and hope. But let's dig down deep into what he's saying here. It's because of their faith and love. Faith. This word in the Greek, the the pistis, is moral conviction of truth. Persuasion of truth. And in return, trusting that same evidence. So having conviction of the truth. Knowing the truth. And in turn, trusting that very evidence. The word, root word is pytho. And that means to be persuaded, to have confidence, to follow, to obey, to have assurance, loyal to a cause, to have fidelity. You see, it doesn't just mean to believe something exists. Faith is a deep word. It involves obedience and confidence in a cause. That cause is Christ. What is this love, the agape? This is self, self-sacrificing love. Love is better to explain in an example than it is to explain in a definition. In 1 John 4.10 it says, And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God is so, loved, so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We know what love is because God first loved us. A true believer puts his brother and sister before himself. So why the faith and love? Where did they get this faith and love from? From hope. This is not the subjective hope as you are hoping for something. This is the hope laid up in heaven. This is an object of hope. What is this hope? Well, we go to the text later on in verse 12, and it tells us what this hope is. Verse 12, 13, and 14. Let's go there. It says, so they're being strengthened, they're attaining steadfastness and patience joyously, while at the same time they're giving thanks to the Father who has qualified them to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, who rescued us rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom. The kingdom. So we have inheritance, the kingdom. And then we, it says, of the son of his love in whom we have redemption. So inheritance of the kingdom. We have redemption. And lastly, the forgiveness of sins. 
which are related, which is related to our redemption. So we have inheritance, the kingdom of God, redemption, and the forgiveness of sins. That's the hope laid up for us in heaven. That is the hope is our inheritance, our redemption, our forgiveness of sin. That's laid up for us in heaven. And we hear about those things in the gospel. And when we hear about that verbal gospel from someone that tells us, we act on it in faith. And then our faith leads to love for one another. So we have faith, love, and hope, the objective hope. Well, this is laid up for them in heaven. It's secured, it's promised by God, as it says in his word. So it says, this was previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. Well, the word of truth is the gospel. It's the word that contains truth, which is the gospel. This is where they heard of the hope. In the gospel. This is why it's necessary to share the gospel. You can't live out gospel and not speak it to someone and think that they're going to be saved. You have to tell them the gospel. They need to know the hope that's laid up for them. And at the same time, they need to know their destiny if they don't have faith in that very same hope. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 spells out this faith and hope very well. It says, now faith is, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. So faith is the assurance of things hoped for. I mentioned that assurance earlier when we talked about faith. Being persuaded, having confidence to follow, to obey. You don't have faith and confidence in anything that you're not assured in. And Hebrews 1 spells that out greatly. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. This is the objective hope, not the subjective hope, which you have hope in something or in God. Hope brings about faith. The inheritance brings about trusting, brings about joy from the confidence that we share And we share that joy. It's overflowing to other believers. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Listen carefully to what it says. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. That's our hope, the inheritance, the forgiveness of sins, the redemption. That's our hope, the things above. So keep setting your mind on the things above. And then down in verse 14, above all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The result of that hope overflows to the love which is presented by faith. That's the bond of unity. Where does that bond come from? From the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enacts all these things. It initiates and continues these, this faith and this hope. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read verse 1 and through 5. And listen, listen at these words carefully. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, exhort you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's that bond again. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. So the spirit brings about our unity together as Christians, as we express our faith in acts of love. That's important. Then he talks about the power and the nature of this gospel. Chapter 1, verse 6. This gospel, which has come to you, Just as in all the world, 
Also, it is constantly bearing fruit and multiplying, just as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard and understood the grace of God in truth. This nature, let's talk about the nature and the power of the gospel. He says it has come to you. We kind of brush over that kind of wording in the scripture. Ah, it came to us. Yeah, okay. But what is he saying here? When Romans chapter 3, 11, it says, there's no one who seeks for God. No one. John chapter 6, verse 44 says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So if no one seeks for God, and no one can come to the Father unless the Father draws him, this points back to the fact that the gospel has come to them. It has come to them. It's funny when I talk to people and they say, I found God. You didn't find God. He's not Waldo. (laughs) So this gospel comes to the believer. Or to the, I'm sorry, to the unbeliever. From believers. It's passed on from believer to unbeliever. Verbally. It's a verbal proclamation. This gospel also is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. That's a paraphrastic phrase. It gives a single verbal meaning. It's, it's at the same time, it's bearing fruit and increasing at the same time. It has an external and an internal aspect to it. Externally, it says, since the day you heard and understood. So you hear and understand the gospel on the outside. But on the inside, it makes you more Christ-like, which allows you to bear fruit for the Spirit. And we know about the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. This, the fruits of the Spirit is love. One of the fruits of the Spirit is love. So we have that link with love once again. So we have this outpouring of the Word imparted into us in which we be- believe in God's Word and those blessings and those promises. And we act on it through faith, and that faith brings about love. It's that hope that initiated the whole thing, the hope in his word. He says, the grace of God in truth. Another word we look over a lot. We know that it's unmerited favor. But, in particular in this text, this grace is talking about God giving his ultimate grace through his son, the sacrificial death of his son. Well, we read about this sacrificial death in what? The word of truth. We hear about it in the gospel. This is his grace presented here in this text in particular. The grace of God in truth. That means without error, without false doctrine. Why is that important? Because in Colossae, they were dealing with a lot of legalism, Gnosticism, syncretism. He's saying that the grace of God in truth is presented to you in the gospel. There is no other way to be saved but through the gospel. The gospel changes people individually and the world all together. He says, just as in all the world. You see, it's not social justice that changes the world. It's not doing good deeds that changes the world. You can give away things. You can... Do nice things. That's great. Good job. You can still go to hell. And so can they, unless they believe in the gospel. They believe in the hope that's laid up for them in heaven. It's this way that changes the world. Well, who delivered this good news, this gospel? Let's read 7 and 8. It says, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow slave, who is faithful servant, of Christ on our behalf, who also informed us of your love in the Spirit. Who is this Epaphras that they learned from? Well, first of all, it's interesting that they use this word that they learned from. You know, in Matthew 26, it says, go make disciples. That word is the word for learner. Here he's saying that they learned from Epaphras. They were disciples of Epaphras, whom they learned from. Matheno is the word. Matheteus comes from that word. They say he's a fellow slave, one who serves the same master is what they're saying. One who serves the same master. If you're a slave, you have a master. 
In this context, they're talking about Christ Jesus, whom before they mention is the Lord, the Kyrios, the Lord, the Master. So they're saying that Epaphras is a fellow slave. He's the one who serves the same master as we do. That's why when somebody says they're a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, they're not a Christian. They do not serve the same master. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Therefore, they don't serve the same master. They're not fellow servants. They call him beloved. Highly esteemed is what they're saying. He's, he's a favorite. He's worthy of love, this Epaphras. Why? Because he's spreading the gospel. He really cares about them. He wants them to know this good news in opposition to the bad news that they will face. He's a servant of Christ. He's faithful. He's trustworthy in the execution of varying duties, especially the gospel. He's the one who informed Paul of their love in the Spirit. This is the love that's provided by the Spirit, brought about by the Spirit. Well, we just talked about in Galatians chapter 5 that the fruit of the Spirit, one of them is love. Love doesn't come on your own. So when people say, I show love to people, I'm a nice person and they're not Christian, that's not true love. Love is provided by the Spirit. We see in Colossians 4.12 that um, Epaphras is with Paul. And let's go to 4.12 and see what Epaphras said about the people here. We can see why he's such a beloved person. It says, Epaphras, who is one of your number, he's a Colossae, or Colossian, a slave of Christ Jesus sends you his greetings. So he's with Paul here. Always striving for you in his prayers, that you may stand complete and fully assured. So he's praying for them to be fully assured. In all the will of God. In all the will of God. You see, he's with Paul. He's a fellow prisoner, it says in Philemon 23. He's a fellow prisoner. There's debate whether or not he was a literal prisoner in Rome with Paul, or he was a fellow prisoner of Christ. But he's with Paul for sure here. Remember, Paul's in prison, but he did receive visitors. So we talked about the power of the word in salvation, and it's the gospel that saves. Now let's switch over to the next sentence. (laughs) The power of the word in sanctification, verses 9 through 12. Well, Paul's previous prayer in verse 3, thank God for their faith and their love, which came from their hope. That's something they already have established. They already have faith and love established from their hope. In this prayer, he's praying for that same faith and love, grounded in hope, to continue to grow. For the growth. You see, it's not good enough that we became Christians at one time. We should continue to grow. We should strive to be better people because of our likeness of Christ. So he asks God for them to be filled. So he prays for them that they may be filled and the full knowledge of his will, and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Filled. What is he saying here? This is like complete saturation. In the Greek, it, it means this, this filled to the brim, to the top of the cup. If you drink coffee, you don't want to have it full to the brim. It'll spill over, right? But this is, he's actually praying for them to be full. If something's full, nothing else can be added. He wants them to be completely saturated, no room for anything else. Full of what? The full knowledge. This is the epignoso. This is the precise and correct knowledge versus the false knowledge that the Gnostics are giving versus the false wisdom that the Jew, uh, Jewish legalists are giving. He wants them to be completely saturated, fully with the wisdom of God, overflowing with the wisdom of God. And then he says here, The knowledge of his will, of his will. God's desire is his will. What is his will? It's revealed to us in scripture. That's how we know God's will. That's why scripture reading is so important. He wills what is good, pleasing, and perfect. Good, pleasing, and perfect is what he wills for his people. Let's go to Romans 12. Romans 12. 
just uh, not far before this. Romans 12, verse 2, you'll like to see this. And remember, we're talking about God's will here. Romans 12, verse 2. And Paul says here, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Good, pleasing, and perfect. That's the will of God. So the knowledge of his will is for us to be good, pleasing, and perfect. (laughs) That's what he wills. But first we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind in order to do his will. That's the obedience. The obedience. And then the more we do that, the more our minds are changed, the more we grow in our sanctification. Go to Colossians 3. We'll talk more about the will of God. What is his will for us? Colossians 3. Verse 5. What is God's will for us? People say, I don't know what God wants me to do. Well, first of all, you should do this. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now... You also lay them aside, wrath, anger, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you put off the old man with its evil practices. He's assuming that they put off the old man with his evil practices. Put off. And having put on the new man, who is what? Being renewed. That's an ongoing renewal, not a one-time thing. Being renewed to a Full knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A full knowledge. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free men. But Christ is all and in all. That's the renewal that he's talking about, which is the will of God. He wants us to be renewed in our mind and to grow in our sanctification and to do his will and be obedient to his word. That's what God wants for us. And then he says, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. First of all, the word spiritual. That's the type of wisdom and understanding he's referring to here. By the power of the Spirit. This wisdom. This is the capacity to understand and to function according by that capacity. So it's the capacity to understand something. And to function or act upon that capacity that you have understood. So acting on what you know. And what is the understanding? Is being able to analyze, to assess, to put the information together. So you understand the information. You can put it all together and then you act on it. But it's spiritual. It's a spiritual wisdom and understanding. Well, why does he want us to have this full knowledge and spiritual wisdom and understanding? So that... So, for the purpose of the following things. Here's what he wants you to do, the practical outworking of this full knowledge and understanding through spiritual wisdom. Why? So that you may walk. Walk. This walking is your daily life, your spiritual journey, if you want to say that. It's your path, the narrow path that Jesus says that people are on that make it to heaven, not the wide path. He wants you to walk. Walk. It's an it's a action, movement. Make progress. Make progress, not stagnant. I'm saved. I'm good to go. Make progress. He wants you to walk. This is what the word allows you to do, to make progress. But if you're not reading the word, you won't make any progress. God's will is for us to obey. John 14, 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then in John 15, 12, he says, this is my commandment. So he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandment. And then he says, here's my commandment. That you will love one another 
just as I have loved you. That's the commandment. In verse 4, we know that they already love each other, but now Paul is calling for an increase in love. An increase of love. In what manner should they walk? In what manner? That's the, that's, the, that's the key. What manner should they walk? Well, in a manner worthy of the Lord. What is this talking about? This means subjection to God alone. Outside of anything else. As worthy representatives of Christ Jesus. We represent Christ here on the earth. We're sojourners here in this land. We represent Christ. Everything that we do. And we're supposed to do that just as faithful servants. Just like Epaphras. He's a faithful servant. We also should be a faithful servant. It says, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow slave, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. That's how we do it in a manner worthy of the Lord. But not from selfish gain or uh, selfishness and promoting self or profit or being puffed up. Not for being puffed up. Look at chapter 2, verse 18. This is the opposite of what we should be doing in chapter 2, verse 18. This is the opposite of a manner worthy of God. It says, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement. Self-abasement. And the worship of the angels going into detail about visions he has seen. Visions he has seen being puffed up for nothing by his fleshly mind. Puffed up. That's not a manner worthy of the Lord. When we give ourselves into subjection to God, that's when we're walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. The result of that is we please him in all respects, in all facets of life. We please him in all facets of life, in everything that we do, from sunup to sundial. And then lastly, In verse 10, beginning with bearing fruit. So he says, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. And you can't see this in the English, but there's a few participles here. It means you do something while doing something else. And he goes through this whole section of participles. And it's bearing fruit, increasing, being strengthened, giving thanks. Those are the participles here. And let's go through those right now. Two of them are active participles and two of them are passive participles. Active meaning something you should do. Passive means things that are done to you. Number one, bearing fruit. Bearing fruit, that's an active thing in every good work. This is the same combination used in verse 6 where it says bearing fruit and increasing. In verse 6, he was saying, you're already, the gospel's already bearing fruit and increasing in you and in the world. But now he says, keep going. Keep going. Bearing fruit and increasing. So bearing fruit, that's something that you do. Bear fruit. Do the, the deeds of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Do the fruits of the Spirit. The increasing. In the knowledge of God, that's something God does. He increases your knowledge. He increases your knowledge. When you read this scripture, God increases your knowledge. As mentioned in verse 9. Being strengthened in verse 11. That's also passive. God strengthens you by his glorious might and power. By his grace, he strengthens you. If you're submissive to his will. What, what is the purpose of this strengthening? To obtain all steadfastness and patience. You ever think about tough people you got to deal with? Tough situations. The steadfastness speaks of our circumstances that we face in life. The patience speaks to the people that we have to be patient with. I'm sure we all know about being patient with people. Well, how, do, how are we able to deal with these situations? By the glory. By his might. By God. And we're supposed to deal with these things joyously. Now, that's a tough one. We think about, man, we're supposed to deal with tough people and tough things joyously? Well, that's what it says here. 
And we know that in James chapter 1, let's all go there. James chapter 1. This is my favorite verse here. It says, verse 2, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. He says, Consider it joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith brings about perseverance. And let perseverance have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. He says, consider it joy when you encounter various trials. Because God's allowing for your faith to be tested. And when your faith is tested, it produces endurance in your life. That's why he's saying joyously with steadfastness and patience. Verse 12, another participle, giving thanks. That's an active one. Active. Giving thanks to the Father who is what? He has qualified us, it says. Qualified us. That means he's made us sufficient through the death, burial, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus through his blood. He's qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. God has qualified us through the work of Jesus Christ. We didn't qualify ourselves. It's not by good deeds. He's qualified us. And it says the saints in light. That's in opposition to the next verse, which talks about darkness. The next verse says he rescued us, so he qualified us. And next we see that he rescued us from what? From the domain of darkness. From the domain of darkness. So we're saints of light by the qualifications of God, and we've been rescued from the domain of darkness by God. Next it says he transferred us Transferred us to what? To the kingdom of his beloved son. The inheritance. The hope. The objective hope that's laid up for us in heaven. That's the word of truth, the gospel, the grace of truth. Teaches us all these things of this inheritance and this hope. And in the end, the apex of this section, it says, this talks about the beloved son. It says, in whom we have Redemption, forgiveness of sins. That's the centrality of Christ. That's the gospel. You see, Paul is saying here, in summary, that it's through the word of God that you're saved. It's through the word of God that you grow. That is the way. Because the word of God comes from God. That's why the scripture is so important. Not that we worship the book itself. But we worship the one who wrote the book, who inspired the text, 2 Timothy 3.16. So if we believe in the God of the Bible, we will be saved. How does someone save? By preaching the God of the Bible, the salvation that comes from his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, for those who believe. So I ask you today, do you believe? Do you trust? Do you have hope? Do you have assurance in God, the God of the Bible, our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you? If not, put your trust in him. Put your trust in the hope that's laid up in heaven. There is a prize to be had. Put your trust in that hope laid up in heaven. If you don't believe, there's time today. Repent and believe today. It's that simple. Repent and believe. There's no secret way other than believing. And with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're astonished at your word and the power that it has to save Lord, you've made a way for all men to believe if they would just put themselves aside and put you first. Lord, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the hope laid up for us in heaven. 
Lord, help us to grow in this knowledge of your hope. Help us to grow in our faith. Amen.